Yeah. Awesome. So we got awesome. We got a big turnout, 182 people. That, uh, that was more than I thought we'd have. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get started. So we'll do a little breakdown of how this call is going to go. I'll introduce Stefan for people who don't know him. Um, so basically I consider Stefan the number one copywriter in the world right now. Um, I called him the modern day Gary Bensavenga. I called him the Michael Jordan of copywriting. Um, his offers, uh, right now is, are converting better than anyone else out there. Um, I would say he's probably neck and neck with Craig Clemens. I think Craig's up there as well. Um, he writes, the way I really judge copywriters is how many offers do you have that work on cold traffic? Cause anybody can write an offer that works to the back end of the list or that sells to people that already know you. But if you can write offers that convert on cold traffic, uh, you are a really damn good copywriter in my book. And in my opinion, Stefan's the best at that because he's got, as of now, I think about six different offers converting on cold traffic, which to kind of put that in perspective. Um, I mean, if you have one offer converting on cold traffic for a couple months or a year, like you're doing damn well. So the fact that he's got six of them going, uh, at one point in his career, he had, um, it written eight out of the top 10 offers on ClickBank. So ClickBank used to have like a top 10 page. And out of those top 10, uh, Stefan had written eight of them, which is honestly just crazy. Uh, we're gonna dig into that a little bit on this call. But um, yeah, so in honor of, Stefan released his RMBC course this week. And so in honor of that, uh, we're really gonna dive into some of the copy strategies and tactics that Stefan does uh, in regards to how he makes his copy convert better than any other copywriter out there. And then we're going to also get into a little bit of the, um, the aspects of copywriting and freelancing and stuff like that for the freelancers on the call. So in terms of getting clients, getting paid more per client, uh, stuff like that. Um, Stephen, anything else you want to add to that? No, it's always a uh, flattering and honoring introduction from you. I appreciate it. Awesome, man. Um, so yeah, the, the only other thing, like I said, I, I want to add is housekeeping wise, please keep yourself on mute. Um, like I said, we, we, every time we do these calls, there's always a few people who take themselves off mute. It winds up kind of ruining the experience for other people, uh, because you can hear all the kind of noises going on in your house or in your room or in your car, or whatever you're doing. So keep yourself on mute if you can. Um, and if you're, off mute and you're making noise and ruin the experience, we're just going to simply remove you from the group. So keep it on mute. With that said, a couple of things we're going to go over on the call. Um, how Stefan went from charging $149 for a sales letter to now charging $50,000 per sales letter. Uh, we're going to go into kind of some of the hacks he uses in his RMBC method. One of them I call the Reddit hack, which lets you know exactly what to talk about to your customers so that you're hitting their pain points exactly. Um, the top leads that he sees working right now. So like I said, he has six different offers working on cold traffic and we're going to talk about, uh, the lead that he's using on most of those offers. That's working like crazy. Um, one of the big questions a lot of people wrote in was how do I get my first client? Uh, so we're going to, we're going to discuss a little bit of that. Stefan has a lot of experience helping freelancers get clients. Um, he even did a whole seminar on this with Ian Stanley talking about, uh, getting clients. So, has a lot to share on that. Writing, writing your offer quickly. Uh, Stefan can write a sales letter in three days, whereas most even good copywriters, it might take four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Uh, it's really kind of insane to be able to write an offer that fast and for it to work. Uh, so he's going to share a little bit of how we do that, how he does that. And then the last one is how Stefan kind of manages his time between writing copy and running multiple uh, million dollar businesses. Uh, which is a really hard thing to do because copy does take so much focus and it takes so much kind of concentrated focus at, in long blocks of time. Um, it, it's, it's not, you can't be sitting in an office with people bugging you and you writing copy. It just <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really work that well. So we're going to kind of dig into that and, and how he does that. Uh, and at the end, if you want, um, we will have a little Q and a as well. Um, Someone mentioned for me to record this. Yep, I got, I got it recording. I remembered this time. So there, uh, yeah, if you miss any of it, we'll, you'll be able to watch it again at the end. Uh, Steph, anything you want to add to that before we kind of dig in? Uh, 
Not really, man. I'm, I'm excited. Um, I'm actually even a little bit nervous, which is weird because you because know, you know, like trainings and zoom things, all kinds of stuff. Um, but I guess maybe cause it's you interviewing me more than, um, just me teaching, but I'm excited. I have a lot of good stuff to share. So really can't wait to, to dive in here. Yeah. I sent Stefan a message before this. I, I really want to dig into kind of where he was before copywriting and share a little bit of his story. Uh, because it's, it's a pretty inspiring story uh, when you think about it. It's very easy to see what, see someone as successful as Stefan and think he was always this way. Um, I know I used to think like that when I first got into the internet marketing world. I'd see guys like John Reese and Frank Kern and Dan Kennedy and think like, oh, they just always have been making millions of dollars. Um, and that's, <laughs> for most people, that's not the way it works. You, you work your way up the chain just like everybody else. Um, so yeah, I mean, the first thing I really want to touch on is I remember you saying kind of in your early 20s, you were kind of floating along, didn't really have a whole lot of ambition as to what you wanted to do. I remember you mentioned thinking like, if I made $40,000 a year, I'd be like doing pretty damn good. Um, I'm curious, what were you actually doing then to make money before you kind of got into copywriting? Yeah, for sure. Um so after like I graduated college in 2010 and that's like its own kind of thing. Cause I originally went to college for a semester after high school and then just smoked weed and drank the whole time, had like a sub 2.0 GPA and dropped out and then took time trying to like kind of figure out what I want to do. Um, and you know, not to go indirect with the answer to the first question you asked me and drive you crazy, but I was thinking about this last night and like, just like a whole list of shit I failed at, right? Because it's like, all right, after high school, I kind of failed at college the first time around, worked at a movie theater where I never showed up, was involved in a music business that uh, went for two years and folded, uh, did go back to school and got a degree and, and kind of found something I was passionate about with, um, you know, uh, studying philosophy and things like that. Then, um, really struggled to find jobs. I was in Pensacola, Florida in 2010, which isn't really an economic hotspot during the good times. And this was post recession. So really my huge goal at that time was to get a job with enterprise rental car because they could pay up to $40,000 a year. And you could even at some point get to six figures. And so I applied with enterprise rental car five or six times. And one time I went to a job fair, made it through the first interview, got to the second one, um, which was with this kind of like, you know, stodgy Southern guy who's maybe 55, 60. And he's sitting there and, and I remember him asking me two questions. He was the manager of that enterprise location. One question was, um, you know, he was like, well, we'll talk about your experience, something that you're proud of or you showed leadership. And I responded that I, well, I worked on the Obama campaign. I was the college coordinator for my Obama campaign in 2000, uh, for the Obama campaign in 2008, which this guy like looked at me like then and there, like, you know, I certainly didn't vote for Obama. Um, and then he's another question was, uh, you know, who's somebody you, you really admire? And I went, Barack Obama. Uh, I really, you know, because he, and I, I guess some like political answer about he, you know, Cl Hillary Clinton was a rival. So he made her secretary of state and really neutralized her as a threat. And I just remember the guy looking at me, like shaking his head. He had like a smirk on his face, like just shaking his head. Uh, and needless to say, I did not get the job. But one of the big lessons that I learned from that is really to know your audience, right? Because I was not, I did not think to talk to my audience. I just sort of was this young idealistic kid. Um, and you know, that probably cost me my opportunity to work at Enterprise Rental Car, which maybe is a good thing. So, but after that, you know, it was just more failed jobs. I went to a, a college, um, I worked for a for-profit college, like in a call center, calling 200 plus phone calls a day, trying to get people to, um, you know, enroll for this kind of bullshit university and take out a bunch of debt. And I felt really shitty. I hated it. I'd have that Sunday night anxiety, knowing I have to come to work on Monday. I'd have that parking lot anxiety Monday morning in my car waiting until the last minute before I had to get out of my car and go in. And then I would chew tobacco the entire time I was there from like 8 a.m. until five o'clock. I'd have a giant thing of chewing tobacco in. And when I left, I actually wouldn't even chew tobacco. It was the weirdest thing. It was just a total coping mechanism because of how much anxiety I had about just hating that job and hating what I was doing and calling people who didn't want to hear from me and all that kind of crap. Um, so yeah, that was a, it was just a string of jobs like that and things like that. And then, you know, I went to uh, a place called the outdoor school, which is in Marble Falls, Texas, about an hour, hour and a half outside of Austin. 
was teaching kids about nature. I, I did that because I kind of wanted to get away from that job I hated and go be in nature. And I thought that's what I was going to do. But then after about five months there, not even maybe four months, I found out my dad had cancer. So I went back home to San Diego to be with my dad and mom. Uh, then I tried a drop shipping store while I was there. The first time I ever tried e-commerce, I, I created a store that sold like sports memorabilia after reading the four hour work week. I used some program called Volusion. I don't know if it's still there in Doba, which was like a drop shipping catalog. Created the site, worked on it from home, never sold a single item, spent, you know, who knows, two months on it without ever, literally never made a sale. Didn't even know how to get traffic to it. Um, my dad passed away, went to Vegas to kind of blow off steam six weeks later. And that's where I met my now wife, Laura. But at the time she was just a girl at a poker table and um, somebody asked her what she did for a living. She said, I'm a writer. I said, what kind of writer? She said, I'm a copywriter. And I Googled what's a copywriter on my phone. And that was my, my first introduction to copy. Uh, so that's a lengthy answer, but I guess it's important to know that even, and there's more failure after that, but that's just up to when I even discovered copy. It was just a bunch of like kind of stuff that didn't work out, you know? Yeah, I remember the first time you told me the story about meeting Laura at a poker table in Vegas. Uh, she said she was a copywriter. You're like, what the hell's a copywriter? And you're sitting there Googling on your phone. After she told you what it was, did it spark any type of interest? Or is it when you guys started dating and she kind of told you more about it? Is that kind of where you were like, oh, this kind of sounds interesting? Yeah, it was more after we started dating. At the time, I was more interested in just getting her to continue interacting with me. Um, you know, cause I thought she was beautiful and, and there she was at the table. Um, but it, it was a really weird thing cause my dad had just died. I didn't really, I didn't have a, a job. I was doing some content writing for a company my sister worked for that basically did SEO. So, and I was getting paid, I don't know, like, like 15, $20 an article, I guess for like a handful of articles. I made a couple hundred bucks a week doing that. And that was really like my only income at that point. And I applied for a job in South Florida, which I ended up getting, but that didn't start until mid, mid February. And, um, I met Laura in like, uh, December, like December 12th. So I had this like kind of like month and a half period where I didn't have anything to do before I started this job. So we just played poker. Like I basically stayed in Vegas. We lived out of either Imperial palace, which isn't there anymore, but it was a shithole, uh, Flamingo, which was like Ritz Carlton to us compared to Imperial palace. So, um, and our, you know, basically those two places and we played poker every day and played tournaments. And then we, we just sort of like lived together in this hotel room playing poker right after meeting. It was very kind of weird, but it was cool. Um, and, and at that point she would like, we'd have like a poker tournament to play at night, but she'd be on her laptop finishing a sales letter for a client or doing something. And I remember kind of trying to understand what she did and I still didn't really fully understand it, but I, the fact that people were paying her. $500 or $1,000 to write stuff like was very intriguing to me. And then, and I've, I've shared this before, but right before I moved to Florida to take that job, I remember sitting at the kitchen table with my mom and my cousin who was in town and, and talking about what Laura did and being like, I don't know, I really think maybe I can just make a living like writing online. Like I, it just seems like that's, this is a real thing. And they both looked at me like I was a complete idiot. And they were like, go to Florida and you know, take that corporate job. Uh, don't, you know, don't be a dummy, which I did. Um, so, and then once in Florida and having that job and realizing that even though it was a good paying job, I was still kind of miserable. That's when I really wanted to see what Laura did because I was like, if I can do what she's doing and be at home and make, you know, four times as much as I'm making right now, um, that's, you know, really appealing to me. So that's when I really, after that, I read some of her sales letters and then that like within a day or two, I wrote my own first sales letter, which was really just a, um, like a warrior for hire, like kind of classified ad on warrior forum saying, Hey, you know, hire me to write your sales letter. Um, and that was the first copy I ever wrote. Yeah. I, rem I remember you telling me the story and it's, it's a really damn good story. So for people who are not familiar with the warrior forum, this was like the internet marketing forum, uh, back in the day, eight, nine, 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure it's still around. Uh, but back in the day it was, it was huge. Everyone, even the biggest name people were, were all on it. I was on it. Um, and trying to learn stuff. And there, they had a section on there where you could post stuff to get hired. And from what I remember, you wrote a post on there as Laura and basically put a little thing at the end saying like, oh, if you want to hire my copy cub, uh, he, 
he actually wrote this post. So if you really like it, like you should hire him. And I think you charge what, like 149 bucks you said for your first sales letter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, a long way you come. A good twist. Yeah, I know. A hundred percent. Um, and it was cool. Yeah. But I woke up with, with two people who had gotten it. So I had 298 in my PayPal and that really was the moment of kind of, Oh my God, I can, I can make money doing something I'm passionate about. And, and all the dreams that we have as freelancers of, of working from anywhere and, you know, never having a boss and all that stuff that ends up not being true because then you're trying to pay all your bills and you have a dry spell or you get a difficult client because you don't know what you're looking for. Um, you know, we went to the Alcapulco, like, I don't know, maybe six months after I went freelancing because Laura's grandmother had like a timeshare and her parents paid for the trip for us to go. And it was like beautiful. And I think Alcapulco kind of, went downhill, but at that point it was still really nice. And I just remember being so stressed out because I had to write um, the sales letter for this dude who was part of the Empower Network, which was like an MLM like network thing back in the day. And um, I, like, I was on a deadline and I didn't, like I, I, I think I laid by the pool one time and went in the ocean one time in like five days. I just stayed in the hotel writing because I was so stressed about trying to get that project done so that we'd have money to like pay our rent and stuff. So. It definitely wasn't uh, as glamorous as I thought, especially early on, you know? But it, it is amazing though, that first sale you make, the first time someone pays you, it changes your perspective on this because you could be grinding for six months, a year, two years, whatever it is. And it, it seems like a pipe dream the whole time. It doesn't actually feel real. Uh, and then when someone pays you, even if it's only 149 bucks to write a sales letter, you're like, holy shit that's the moment things turn real. At least, at least that's what it was like for me. No, definitely. And I actually was making this point to a friend. Uh, he's, he's actually a copy accelerator member, but he was talking about how he still feels worried because he's kind of new and he's doing well as a copywriter, but it's like a, a fear because everything else he tried had kind of has failed in the past, but I was kind of account, recounting my list of failures. And then you know, even with that corporate job, I've created like an, uh, an app called Terrible Parker, terribleparker.com. I think I still own the domain where it was just people took pictures of really bad parking jobs and put them on this app to like put those people on blast. And like, you know, I spent, cause I got like a, like a signing bonus for the company. I think that was why, maybe it was cause I got a little money when my dad died, like, like $5,000 or something. And then, and like I, but I basically spent it on that. Then I created, I wrote a book about business ethics called like, um, if they trust you, they'll pay you, which is like not a great book, frankly. Um, and you know, published out on Amazon. It was like, I can be, cause I was a philosophy major. It's so like, I can be a, you know, an ethics, like business ethics expert. Uh, and then Laura and I created like an e-commerce site called shoevu.com. That was like a shoe search engine that I spent like the rest of my like money on, on that. And, uh, actually that, that one was cool, but we never pursued it. So it's like really when you get to copywriting and all of those failures that haven't worked out and you've spent money and you've never made money and somebody pays you, it is the greatest feeling ever. But I think it takes a while to get really confident even once you get paid a few times because um you know, even then you're like is this just a mirage is it not going to last am i like a fraud i mean there's all the imposter syndrome things and and insecurities that, that kind of creep up too yeah i agree i mean people are usually um kind of stunned to realize like even people like you and i still have that stuff creep in um i mean i, I remember Last year at the Titans Mastermind, the first time uh, Clayton Makepeace was there, I had like a, I wanted to go up and talk to him and I had like a five minute like talk with myself in my head because I was just like so intimidated because <laughs> it was Clayton Makepeace. I was this guy I like looked up to for God knows how long. Um, I actually had the same thing with um, John Reese. I met John Reese at a bar uh, here in Austin. He moved to Austin for a while and he came to a bar with David Gonzalez brought him for it was somebody's birthday. And we're just sitting there and John Reese walks in the bar and John Reese was like the king of online marketing. When I got into this business in like 2005, 2006, he was like God. And I looked up to him like that when I got into it. And I remember John walked in the bar and I was like the first time I was ever been like starstruck in my life. I like almost, I was like kind of like shaking saying hi to John. Uh, we actually ended up becoming pretty good friends. We were playing, playing basketball uh, a couple times a week while he still lived here. Um, but yeah, it is interesting because even people like you and I, like that stuff still pops up. Yeah. I mean, two, two examples for me, one would be like Joe Polish who I've been in like an intimate room with him twice. One at, um, Amber Spears's Mimosa mastermind. And then once with, 
with uh, Brian, who I just all chatted about playing, uh, Brian Kurtz's Titan Sing in uh, Scottsdale, and uh, have not ever introduced myself to Joe Polish, even though both times I was like, oh, I think he's really cool. Have some done it. And then the other one is Jay Abraham, same thing. I've been in intimate rooms with him twice, once, I forget where, and once through Brian, and have never said hi to Jay Abraham. And like, it's so, I don't know, you know, I mean, I've, I've had a pretty good run here, but I'm, I'm still kind of intimidated by people to be completely honest with you. Um, it's, it's like an ongoing battle, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. So anybody who's watching who may be intimidated by uh, people you think are kind of above you, uh, you're not alone in that feeling. It, it, it kind of happens to everybody. Um, so I, I want to dive into, so you got your first client. Was Laura the one teaching you copy at that point? Were you just learning from her? Were you studying stuff online where you're reading books. I'm, I'm kind of curious where you started getting your first like copy chops from. It was, it was mostly her. Um, I honestly just was like, show me uh, what you do. And so I kind of read some of her, her sales letters that had worked. Cause you know, she was a, did a lot of stuff in kind of biz op. Like uh, I am a lot of like launches of, you know, FB ad scrapers cracked or whatever, just kind of products to help people like what the, the kind of products that were sold on warrior forum. So I studied a lot of like just her stuff. Um, and then when I talk with clients early on, I would ask for examples. I'd be like, Hey, what are examples of kind of what, what competitors are doing? And that was really helpful. Cause if they, what they showed me as being like what they held up as good copy or that, that they were wanting to emulate, then I, it was easier for me to emulate that. And the, since they already liked it, if what I wrote looked like whatever they liked already, they were more likely to be happy with it. Um, but of course I had no idea if what I was writing was actually good or not. And if it was going to convert or not. And that was a huge problem. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the scariest thing. You, you, you work hard on something, but you have no idea if it's going to work. Um, right. And I mean, obviously we still have that even no matter how good you get, you never know with certainty, but with what my system and RMBC and all that kind of stuff I do now, there's a way higher probability. So I'm less anxious uh, today, but back then it was very hard to know. Right. Now, one thing I want to dive into. So I first heard of you around 2014. This was in uh, the Lions Publishing days. So you were writing copy for a company called Lions Publishing, which um, was this group of Romanian guys that basically just dominated ClickBank for, I don't know, a year or two years. Um, if you looked at anything on ClickBank, like the top health offers, it was, it was literally all Lions Publishing products. Um, and this was the time when I said Stefan was just owning the front page of ClickBank. I think eight out of the top, top 10 offers were written by Stefan. Uh, he basically put out offers that turned line publishing into what a hundred million dollar company, something like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, this company just blew up out of nowhere. Uh, they were just putting out offers left and right, just crushing every single kind of vertical within the health niche. And I remember kind of hearing your name at that time because I, I had studied some of the BSLs um, and they were really damn good. I remember kind of your emotional storytelling hooks at the beginning that just like grabbed my attention every single time. Um, but then the thing that I heard about you that was probably the most crazy was someone told me that you were writing like eight to 10 sales letters a month. And I remember just yeah. being shot. I, I honestly didn't believe it. I was like, there's no fucking way you can write eight to 10 sales letters a month. <laughs> um, I didn't believe it. Um, because at the time I probably took a good six to eight weeks to write one sales letter, uh, probably even more than that if you included the research. So the fact that you were knocking out eight in a month, I thought was just absolutely insane. Um, so I'm curious how you kind of developed that. Oh man, we've got people chiming in, ruining our call. Uh, I'm curious, I'm curious how you kind of developed that skill of being able to crank out sales letters that quickly. For sure. Yeah. It, so a couple of things happened in like the middle of 2013, I got hired by a guy named, uh, E Y I, um, on warrior forum. I was charging like 497 a letter at that point. Cause I'd really moved up and yeah, he basically sent me 997. So he basically make double and he was like, Hey, I just want you to make this really good. Uh, but the sales that I'm going to hire you for, but also if you're, if you want to talk about it, if you kind of want to chat, like I'm here to chat. And I, you know, normally when clients say that they want to kind of chat about it, they're sort of want to micromanage you. And, you know, Kate, we love you. So you get, you get a warning, but you got to mute yourself. It's muted now. Okay. Um, but, um, 
Yeah. So, so basically like I, I did, I ended up talking to the guy of running ideas by him, things like that. He, and he gave me stuff to model and, and he ended up being the first person to kind of show me that, Hey, there's a common structure to sales letters that they sort of follow the same kind of general like points again and again and again. And the sales that I wrote for him was for like an energy, like a DIY generator type thing. Um, and it, it did okay. And, and they ended up hiring me for more stuff. Uh, at the time he was partnered with Tryon Saba, who is, you know, super cool guy, still in our space. And the two of them started investing, um, like in me more, like, like telling me to read about fascinations or giving me controls or kind of dissecting copy and giving it to me. And so they, they really invested in me, which is I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, and through that is where my copy started actually getting better. Um, I still, you know, wasn't super fast and I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I started to have seen enough copy and understand the structure and, and all these sorts of things where I was writing good copy pretty consistently for these guys by the end of 2013. And then he left what try on to go partner in the health space with another guy named uh, Clayton. And they started these health offers and they had me write the first one. It was for like a blood sugar info product. And I wrote that and it did really well. And at first the like, guy had asked like, Hey, I, you know, I would like to write for you guys full time. And I said, we don't really want that burden. You know, you're like, what if we, you know, we don't have to kind of be responsible for your livelihood. Cause I had started like an SEO agency at the, during that same time that kind of was like, okay. Um, but I missed copy and, and not having to deal with a ton of clients, but the blood sugar thing did really well. So they came back and said, all right, you know, actually we will. But the thing was they really, because especially uh, Yi really felt like, copy was so formulaic and that there's the same structure again and again, he like truly believed that you could write a sales letter in like a day. And so, you know, he would like give me a new gig and I'd be excited and I'd be like, all right, cool. Like, you know, how about four weeks? And he would laugh and he'd literally, you know, he'd be like four weeks, like, come on, man, you know, you could write that in 24 hours. What, what, what's so complicated? You know, you have like, you know, the structure and, and he would sort of give me all this shit for it. Uh, and, you know, basically through writing some good copy for them and, and th their stuff was working, we were able to get, uh, I put a deal together with, it was almost like a put your money where your mouth is from, for them, but they basically did a deal with me where it was, if I could write four sales letters in a month, I could get paid a thousand dollars per sales letter. But if I wrote 12 sales letters in a month, I got paid $4,000 per sales letter. So it's the difference between 4,000 and $48,000. And then on top of that, they would pay me these bonuses for unique mechanisms where if I had good unique mechanisms that I brought to them that got turned into sales letters, I would get another thousand dollars. So suddenly that's 60,000 and I get paid for subject lines and email creatives and all this stuff to where I could make like 70 to $80,000 in a single month. And this is coming from a guy who basically never made more than 10,000 in a month. And that was like a really, really good month. So it was a really awesome opportunity, but of course the question becomes like, all right, but now I have to write, 12 sales letters in a month, which is a sales letter every 2.5 days. Plus I have to do mechanisms and emails and subject lines and all that. You know, how the hell do you do that? Uh, um, so kind of like the way I ended up approaching it is I, I sort of looked at like what my process was. Cause I realized I had to make it like an assembly line. I really did have to treat copy, kind of commodify it. There still was going to be an art form to it, but I had to really look at what's like an assembly line pr process for writing sales copy and especially like a long kind of sales letter. And when I looked at it, it was like, what's the first thing I do? And it was research, right? Because if I don't know, you know, who I'm writing to, who I'm talking to, what I'm selling, any of that stuff, then I'm not going to do very good. So I had to do research about the market. I had to do research about the product that I was going to sell. I had to do research about the um, existing solutions out there and whether the market liked them or not, what their beliefs were. I did research about conspiracy theories because if there's some conspiracy about why the status quo solutions don't work, that could be good for the copy. So research was the first thing I did every time. And then when I looked at it after that, I'm like, well, what's the next thing I do? And it was really creating a unique mechanism, which is something that originally uh, Yi taught me about, the kind of the mechanism. And as I looked at it, I realized that there's really two parts to this. So there's a unique mechanism behind uh, the problem and behind the solution. And with the problem, what you're basically trying to do is you're trying to explain to the prospect who's seen all these other solutions before the real reason why they haven't succeeded in the past, right? They've been trying to solve this pain point and they haven't. So we have to show them a really unique reason for that. Um, otherwise, 
if you're just sort of telling them something they've heard before, then they're gonna be like, well, yeah, I've heard that before, so this isn't for me. Or if your solution uses the same mechanism as other people's solutions do, they're like, well, I've already tried that and it didn't work. So I had to figure that Step out. Up. Let's, let's dive yeah. into an example of that so people can really kind of understand what the mechanism is. Yeah, totally, totally, good, good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I always, my, my super go-to one is um, like Pimsleur approach, which is sort of a mechanism tied into a paradoxical question and Chris Haddad wrote that offer for Dan Reutemann. Um, and it did like, the company did nine figures a year at one point. But really it was this idea, so it was a language learning software where a program where you could learn to speak a foreign language. And basically what they had, the unique mechanism of the problem, well, first they asked a paradoxical question, which is worth mentioning. And, and this was, why is it that it's so easy for a child to learn a language, but so hard for an adult? Right, and you're like, think about it. A kid just in, inherently learns a language. There's no flashcards or memorization or going to school. A kid just like learns. But for adults, if, if I want to learn Spanish or Russian or anything, then it's a huge struggle. So why is it the kids can learn a language so easily and adults can't? And the answer was basically that kids learn in a very different way than adults do. Kids learn through listening and basically like innately they innately listen and then they learn to like speak it through listening whereas adults learn to speak it through rote memorization speaking. So the unique mechanism of the problem is that you're being taught all of these language learning programs out there are doing it the wrong way. They're focusing on memorization, flashcards, uh, like you know, classes and things like that. But the, rea the real truth is that that's not how people learn languages. They learn like a child does through listening and through these sort of innate skills that you can develop. Um, so there's your problem. Problem is like, you're not learning like a child. Solution, learn like a child. And so, but that, you know, it may sound simple, but that alone differentiates what they were doing from every other language learning program out there that's like, you know, fast and easy, vocab, like 20 minutes a day, like all this other stuff, like great, but it's like, I've already tried that stuff and I didn't learn language and I gave up. But now that you have this whole new paradigm shift and this new mechanism behind the problem and solution, suddenly it's like, well, I never tried it like that. So maybe this really will work for me. And once you get the prospect into that frame of mind, um, they're way more likely to be receptive to your offer and to potentially buy it because now they're really believing this is something different. Um, so it's really vital to have that. And I, I realized I wanted to figure that out. I need to figure that out before I wrote the rest of the promo because that's almost like, it's like my USP, like my unique selling proposition, but it goes even deeper than that. It's like my core argument I'm going to be making throughout the whole thing. So if I don't know what that is, um, you know, how can I structure the rest of the copy around it? So um, just to really clarify important. things for people, Stefan's, the RMBC method stands for research mechanism brief copy. Uh, what we're talking about now, we just covered a little bit of the research phase, uh, which is all the preliminary stuff in terms of figuring out the pain points of the markets, the wording they use, uh, stuff, products they've tried before, stuff like that. And then we just talked about the M, which is the mechanism. So, and he explained that pretty well um, in terms of the unique mechanism of what the problem is and then the unique mechanism that's kind of the answer to it. Exactly. And, and again, this was born out of me looking at how I really did kind of approach this prior to writing offers already, especially the successful ones. And from there I looked at it and it was like, okay, what do I do next? And it was, it was cause then you're like, well, maybe I should just start writing. But then I thought about it, like, there, there's always these certain questions that I need to answer. And if I don't answer them, I always get stuck in my copy, like every time. So some of them kind of already get answered during research in the mechanism, like who's the market, what are their pain points, what existing solutions have they already used, stuff like that. Uh, but then even just things that seem obvious, like what's, what is the product, like what's in it? And so you, know, you can answer it like um, it's a blood sugar supplement or it's a guide to annuity, inve or annuity investing. Like, okay, great but that doesn't actually do a whole lot for you when it comes time to write your copy. But if I can actually sit there and write out what the product is, like as if it was gonna go in the sales letter, that forced me to like really know what I was selling. So if I, if I answered that question before I actually started the sales letter, I knew what I was selling. Um, plus then it turns out that part's already written now. So when I go to write the sales letter, I can just plug it in. But there's a bunch of other questions like that too. You know, what's the background story, the story of discovery, um, what, you know, Going back to paradoxical questions, is there an interesting paradoxical question I can ask? I had a whole, I think I don't, 12 or 13 questions uh, that I was like, I really need to answer these 
before I start writing. But then what I realized is if I write, if I, when I answer those, when it comes time to do the final step, and so I call that the brief, because it was like this, I like got a bunch of questions I can answer to call it the brief. And then C, copy being the last step, I realized, okay, well, once I have all these questions answered, I have my research, I've done my mechanism. Now I just need to follow like a really templatized approach to like writing sales letters that follows the same structure that basically all sales letters use. And I can plug in everything from the brief, the mechanism, my research. And if I just sort of go through and check everything off, I, it's like a paint by a number sales letter. It really is. And so I kind of had outlines from other people, but I put together mine based on what I'd written for the guys at Lions Publishing that had worked continuously. And there's only like seven broad kind of uh, parts to it. And then there's like, but there's like 55 sort of sub bullets. And what I, but again, being like paint by numbers, 55 sounds like a lot, but I realized, okay, well, if I just sort of make sure everything's checked off and I go down in order, then I'm going to cover everything that's in the good sales letter. And it almost becomes at that point impossible to write a bad sales letter. You can, it may not be the, the world's greatest sales letter, right? Every time, but you're, you're, because you're checking every box by following that outline that I created, I realized I could, I could very consistently write very good copy. And the, the main outline, the main structure for you guys, I mean, it's just like the lead, right? Which is your intro, um, grabbing their attention, hooking them in, promises, calling out the pain point, things like that. Your background story and, you know, the discovery uh, leading up to like a breaking point, realizing that something needed to change. And, and our, our spokesperson had to look for like, you know, solutions. He tried out of the box things, but they didn't work. Um, then he, he stumbles upon the unique mechanism of the problem. We explained that to them. That leads to the unique mechanism of the solution. So now he's like, oh, okay, this is the real solution. But now he can't just, there's no out, out of the box solution that, that kind of encompasses the unique mechanism. He has to create it himself or he finds somebody who's already created it. There's trial and error involved. That leads to, which is the product build up and reveal is that section. And that leads to like really just the close, which for me is where you introduce the product and then go into telling them to buy it. And you're you know doing a bunch of stuff on the checklist as you go through it. And then the final part there is just uh, FAQs after the fact because they increase conversions and sometimes people don't do them and it's shocking. So lead, background story, uh, unique mechanism of the problem, unique mechanism of the solution, product build up and reveal, close, FAQs. And then a bunch of stuff in there. So I realized that that was the kind of the process I was taking. And of course I, I improved upon this process as I was coming up with it. And then I put it to the test and what I found and what's amazing and, and people find this, we have a lot of people who've done the same thing now for MBC and have found some more things is that, you know, research took me now, really took me a couple hours. I, there's something like 22 questions to answer. Um, and, you know, it's some, it always feels longer when you're doing it, but really like two or three hours, you answer all those questions. Um, and really I mostly go to forums and Amazon to get my answers and we can go back into that in a second. But it was like, okay, a couple hours there. Mechanism, I don't know, maybe two or three hours there, four hours. Okay, so maybe it's like three hours for research, four hours for you know the mechanism, sort of seven hours. The brief, uh, maybe another three hours because I already have answers about my mechanism, my research. So now we're at 10 hours and then, but because the brief has a bunch of chunks of copy already written, now I'm painting by the numbers. And now maybe it takes me six to eight hours to write the sales letter. You know, maybe, maybe call it seven hours. So that's like 17 hours. And like, that's total. And then you're done with the sales letter. So suddenly when I, when I did that and I kind of like realized it, I'm like, oh my God, you actually can write a sales letter in a, a day. I mean, it's a long ass day. Like, I don't think most people want to do it, but it's entirely possible. And I, you know, I've since done this and time myself a ton of times and I've written sales letters in a day before and they've done great. Um, but even like, you know, we have like Ryan Hunter, who's in our copy starter mastermind just used RMBC for the first time. And he timed himself going from start to finish on a first draft. And I think it took him 32 hours, which is not as fast as 17 hours, but still to go for like a, yeah, it's a solid, very solid letter. And you know, it's like 10,000 words and he did it in 32 hours. So, you know, obviously you can see the value in that because if you could write a sales letter a week, I mean, there's 40 hours in a work week. So in less than a, a standard work week, you can write a full sales letter. If you can do four of those in a month, um, you know, you're really cooking. And, and then the other thing too, is like all the research and the mechanism, all that, it, it actually plays into advertorials and email swipes and email creatives and uh, Facebook ads and all these other things can all follow RNBC. But when you're not writing a sales letter, it's even faster to do that stuff. So once I, kind of cracked that code. Um, the first sales that I wrote for the guys using that 
did really well. And then from there, that's when I started pumping out uh, 12 sales letters a month on my best months. And I did that for several months straight and wasn't entirely suicidal and depressed because I actually did have free time and spare time and I would go do stuff. Uh, but it was really because of that method. It was, it was, so that was a huge game changer for me, obviously. That, that was a huge, huge shift to realize that it was possible. Um, so I want to jump into a couple of the bullet points that I teased in the emails and uh, in the Facebook group about kind of some of the stuff that we're going to cover. Um, probably the biggest one that, that I got questions on from freelancers was how you kind of went from, like I said, the guy who was charging $149 to a sales letter to nowadays you charge uh, $50,000 for a sales letter. And I think last I talked to you about this, um, you were basically like booked, I don't know, a couple of months ahead. Um, what was that path kind of like and how did you, how did the raising of your rates go uh, along the way? Yeah, for sure. No, it's, it's a good question. And yeah, I'm booked. And actually for anyone watching this, like you legit can't have I mean, I just, somebody just offered me 50,000 50, and I told him no. And I told him to hire someone copy accelerator. So hopefully he does, but uh, I'm just, yeah. But, which is amazing. So I'm super blessed to be able to do that. I, I truly believe that. But um, yeah, so I mean, okay. One of, the, one of the stock answers, but it's really true, is like getting really good at your craft, right? Because if you look at it with these guys at, at Lions and, and E and, and everything like there, um, it's like, you know, they, the first they weren't, they were still paying me, you know, a thousand, which is, which is great. I mean, that, that was better than when I was doing 149. Um, but my stuff kept working for them because I, 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 I focused on all the resources they gave me and I would like, you know, read sales letters and read swipes and study stuff and my copy got better. And so they would hire me for more projects. So suddenly I had this well of anytime I wanted to write a new project, I could come to them and they would hire me. And I even have a friend now who's an ex-business partner where it's the same thing. I can come to him and be like, Hey, I want to write something and he'll hire me for 50,000 now. But like he, you know, he has like an infrastructure to be able to put out a lot of offers, but it's because we've done stuff together and he knows how good I am. So that's true today when I charge 50,000, but it was true at a thousand, but not only that, but as stuff was working and, and doing well, and I was getting data from them, which is really important. You need to ask your clients for data. So you know how your stuff's doing. Um, and you want to do that so you can get better. But of course, if they keep telling you how great your stuff's going, it's reasonable for you to be like, Hey, that's awesome. You know, uh, based on this and, and kind of the value I'm bringing, like, I really feel like it would be fair for me to ask to like kind of charge, increase my rates. Like I don't want to, um, you know, overstep anything, but I do want to, um, yeah, I want to keep growing. You know, is there something we can work out that's fair. And through that alone with those clients, like that you have, that are repeat clients, especially early on, it's really easy. It's harder when you're at 50,000 to get somebody to go to 60,000 or 75,000. When you're at 1,000 and you want somebody to go to 2,000 or 3,000, it's pretty easy to get them to say yes if they're like a good client and if you're making the money. So that's why being like the best really is super like important or, or being really good at it, like focusing on your craft, getting good, everything there. Um, you know, with the Lions guys, again, I got lucky in that they were able to scale the stuff so there's, there's a, a component of that is as much as you can getting the right clients. I understand it's hard when you're first working out. And I talked about this in the Facebook group where I would take everything early on. So I did like a, you know, how to start your own house painting business letter or dog product letters or, you know, law of attraction letters and all kinds of different niches and verticals. And I would even do, you know, content writing really early on. Um, Eric Barstow, what's up? Yeah. Eric Barso, Elance, August 2012, hired me for that house painting letter, crushed it until you got banned, kicked off Facebook for a little bit or whatever. But, you know, I don't know how I made a house painting offer black hat, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, that's awesome. And um, yeah, so just be, but then Eric, I don't know if you remember, but Eric came back and hired me for something else, like after that too. And this was way back in the day. I haven't talked to Eric since 2012, but it's fucking awesome to see him here. And there's other clients like that too. So, um, yeah, that's just a huge part of it, man. And, and then get, getting good clients who are able to scale is really important to it. When you're able to get those opportunities, really going as, as hard as you can to try and deliver for those clients who have the potential and the infrastructure to really make sure your stuff sees the light of day. Because once it does, it becomes a lot easier to leverage that in your name and, your, and, and, and help with your name and your reputation. If you're talking to a client, the biggest, easiest way to get hired by a prospective client is to show them five things that are similar what they're doing that are working right now and be like oh you know this offer yeah i wrote that oh shit right if you can do that as soon as you can have that conversation with the right client 
they're going to hire you pretty much every single time. Um, and then you can charge more because they know how much that thing's, they're a new client. So you don't have to do your rate you started with. You can kind of increase your rates from there. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the one thing I, I, I want to emphasize, there is nothing that will get you clients faster than having a track record of writing stuff that is a winner. Uh, because everybody in this industry talks to each other. Everybody knows each other. Uh, if you write an offer for someone and it works and they're scaling it and they're making a bunch of money, uh, not only will they want to hire you again, but so will other, other businesses. So, um, yeah, like, like you're saying, the quickest way to get better clients to make more money is to simply write better offers that actually scale. And that all comes from, uh, really having a better process and being a better copywriter. A hundred percent. And then just to preemptively answer a question that some people ask as well, that's related is okay. What if you don't have any clients? And what's cool is that Justin, you and I are super aligned on this. I talked about it in, um, during the freelancing thing with Ian, and then I know you did a post about it and you've been talking about it. I don't know which one of us, I don't know if you just both had the idea at the same time or I stole it from you or whatever, but it really is to do something for free for a potential client, but, but not don't offer to work for free. Um, but actually do something. So if you have a client you want to work with and you've identified, if you can reach out to them with an email creative or some headlines to split test or a new lead for their sales letter or a new Facebook ad, and you can message them on Facebook or Instagram or email them and be like, Hey, I'm a huge fan. Um, you know, like I think what you guys are doing is awesome. My name is whatever my name is. I'm an up and coming copywriter. And I decided since I'm you know, getting my chops and I would love to work for you, I decided to go and just write this new lead for you guys. It's kind of based on what you're doing, but I just think uh, it could really do well for you and get a great ROI. And, you know, I'd love for you guys to test it out. So here it is. And if you're able to test it out, awesome. If not, no big deal. But of course, if you want to keep me in mind for future projects, you know, that would be great. Um, and like, that's basically it, right? And then a couple of things end up happening. So one is like, you've cut through all the clutter, right? Because like now, like I literally have had people and again, I'm very, I'm thankful for this, but I have people offer to do stuff for free for me every day at this point in my career, which is really cool. But it's like in my head, it's also like work for me because I'm like, all right, when well, I have to like think of jobs for you and manage you and are you going to do a good job? And what if you don't do a good job? Do I have to mentor you now? And or do I have to tell you that you didn't do a good job and make you feel bad. And then you think I'm an asshole. Like there's all this stuff that goes on. Right. But if somebody just comes in and is like, here's like a sample, here's something for you. Not a sample for you specifically then I can immediately envision what working with that person would look like. Right. And cause I'm like, Oh, okay. Like they could write for me. That's good. And a lot of the big business owners have constant copy needs all the time, right? They need more email creatives. They need more swipes. They need more of this, they need more of that. So what ends up happening too, is if you reach out with a copy sample and it's like a good sample, um, they may just hire you for something entirely different. This actually happened. One dude, I brought him up on the copy of starter call. He sent me 10 emails, which I love. Like 10 emails saying he wanted to write for me and he, he would do it for free and all of that. And then he finally showed me like, did he did something for me finally. And at that same time, um, I was like watching the RMBC thing and I have my, my sales letter, which I wrote and I think is awesome. But I was like, I want to try like a more, you know, kind of cold traffic biz op version. So I was like, Hey man, you know what? I got something for you. If you want to try to do a version of my sales letter, that's, you know, more like focused on like for the biz op crowd, like do it and I'll run it. And if it goes, you know, well, then we can do more projects and we'll figure something out. So this guy followed up with me like 10 different times and like sent me a sample, but then suddenly I launched this course and I had an urgent need or pain point. So I was like, all right, fuck it. You want to do this? And I offered it to him. Um, you know, another dude sent me like an advertorial he wrote like, uh, like last week and he messaged me about other stuff and I hadn't really responded. Then he sent me this advertorial and it was like pretty cool. And I'm like, Oh, Hey man, this is cool. Like, can you make these tweaks? And then we can test it out. And if that works well, I'll, I'll have you do more stuff for me. So it's just so much more effective than, Hey, like, I'll do anything to work for you for free. It's like, I'm, I'm honored. I'm truly honored, but I just, that that's like work for me. And so, but I'm not, I'm I, everyone's the same way, right? Like Nick, Nick is the same way at V shred, you know, Justin, you're the same way. Anybody we know, like, so that's just a huge, huge, huge thing for kind of how to get your first clients and, and how to get your foot in the door. Yeah. I mean, it really makes you stand out um, because if you think about it from a business owner's perspective, like Stefan said, we're getting hit up every single day. People asking uh, if they could write for us, if we'll hire them, all kinds of stuff like that. So if you simply show up in a different way and you do some work ahead of time, you literally just separate yourself from the rest of the copywriters that are in their inbox. Um, and like we said, maybe write them a couple of emails, maybe write them a lead for their sales page. 
actually do some real research on, okay, what products of theirs are doing well, uh, which ones have maybe been running for a while and might need the lead refreshed. Stuff like that is, it, it's crazy how much uh, that affects the business owner and the way they look at you. You have a much better chance of picking up a client doing that. Yeah, and also like be persistent too, right? Like, um, but actually I'm gonna, Richard Armstrong who's here, I'm honored you're here, Richard, but that a very good point is don't make the mistake of criticizing what they're doing now. Um, that happens. Nick Daniel, who's in Copy Accelerator and, and I've read a bunch of stuff for them. Like he, he'll send me screenshots because people will be like, hey, like your marketing's okay, but here's some stuff you could be doing a lot better. And he's like, I'm scaling to $200 million this year. And you're like, you know, messaging me like on LinkedIn telling me that my stuff sucks. And he'll, he'll be kind of a dick in his responses. But to his credit, you know, it, it, it's a very bad approach. So that's a super, super important point, Richard. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and the other thing that I was going to say, Justin is, is, and for, for the freelancers is really don't be afraid to be persistent because when people don't respond to you, at least for me, I know when I don't respond to somebody, it's not because I'm like F this person it's because I'm busy. I have a bunch of stuff going on. I'm running, you know, multiple seven and eight figure companies and things like that. And like, you know, so I can't, but if someone messages me once and then I'm busy and can't respond, like I'm going to forget about it. But if they kind of keep coming back and hitting me up repeatedly, then they're going to get on my radar. So like, it's very rare that you're going to piss somebody off by continuously following up. And then the worst case scenario is they're going to respond to you, which is great because now you truly have been acknowledged by them. And they might say like, Hey, I'm kind of busy right now. You know, I, I, I check back with me in a few months or something like that. And you yeah. know, I think that's totally important advice too. Okay. So let's, uh, let's keep rolling on the kind of some of the bullets I had that we wanted to cover in this. Um, I mentioned your Reddit hack, which for figuring out exactly what the market wants, it's not actually a Reddit hack, it's more of a forum hack, uh, an Amazon hack. But the way you do research and the way you figure out exactly what people want before you write a sales letter and get the exact phrasing, uh, to me is, is really brilliant. Um, I think it'd be cool if we went over like a quick example of that to show people. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so like I said, with the research, it's like really, um, I want to go to like forums and I want to go to like Amazon, but forums are really my favorite spot. And the reason why is because in forums, you have people just sort of talking unfiltered about their pain points or problems or solutions or state of mind and all this other stuff. And there's forums on everything. There's forums on real estate, on investing, on health, on wrinkles, on beauty, on parenting. I mean, whatever you want to, you're interested in there's forums on it. And what you'll find is that people very rarely just answer questions. They tell stories, you know? Um, I, I use this example, but this one of my favorites is like for cats. Like we have, we have two cats and which are, um, and when they, when they have health issues and I've Googled it and you'll find these like cat forums and it's never just like, Oh, my cat had it too. It was like dermatitis. It went away in a week. It's these crazy cat ladies telling, multi-paragraph long stories where they're like, you know, Fluffles, you know, Fluffles is a rascal who like, always wants to sit on mom's lap. Like she's a two and a half year old tabby who I adopted from here. She's my fifth cat. And here, you know, this whole story about like Fluffles, the cat, and then them as a cat owner and what the products they buy and what they're, all this, like, they're giving you so much information. So that just gives you incredible insights into your market. What I really like to do is like, I'll just take it and copy and paste like stuff. I'll, I'll copy and paste like lines and excerpts and things from what the market's saying in forums, put it into my research document. Because then when I'm writing the copy, I'm talking to my prospect like truly in their own words. I'm not even having to like guess or pretend. It's like, I'm just stealing their language, like appropriating it and then deploying it against them or, you know, for them and to them so that they can learn. I think this is like, just like the best. Um, so yeah, Reddit is a cool place. I, you know, I used to use the example of uh, fat people stories for weight loss. There's this Reddit thread uh, called like fat people stories and people telling their horror stories and embarrassing stories about being overweight. Um, and there's a, the Google like uh, discussions plugin you can add now where anything you type, it'll actually show you all the forums uh, that you've got. Scott Goodman, yeah, mute yourself, bro. Mailbox is full, but um, yeah. So I think forums are just really, uh, really valuable here. And there's, I know, yeah, Gary says there are forum for healthcare professionals. I'm sure there is. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be willing to bet 
tons of money. But yeah, so, so that's kind of the hack there. But again, the key is like, not just like, do you get great psychological insights, but the fact that you can kind of steal their language and use it. And like, even the terminology and phrasing they use, right? Like for on a, on a gun rights forum, they say 2A all the time, which means second amendment. Or on parenting mommy, mommy forums, it's like DD, right? For daughter dearest or like DS for dearest son and like the shit like that that you could potentially take and deploy. So that's where I just think that this stuff is really important. Um, yeah, Felix, I know you said forums can be found specifically in Google. Yeah, I just Google whatever the subject is in forums and I go through and there's a Google discussions plugin that you can use as well that can help you to find even more forum uh, answers. Yeah, it's really simple. Just go to Google, like if you're looking for keto, just type in keto forums. If you're looking for diabetes forums, do that. Um, it's super simple to find these forums and, and you'll be able to find, uh, you find real people talking in real language that they probably wouldn't use in person because when they're typing on a forum, they don't, they're not really worried about what they say because they're not like saying it to someone face to face. They feel a little more anonymous. Yeah. And what also is cool is you, you may even discover new unique mechanisms through forums as well. Like I was looking at weight loss forums, for example, this is my, my RBC course. And it was like a thread from 2011 or 12. And I like, like it was like one thread out of like a hundred started talking about keto and people were talking about the keto diet and this is a keto like diet good. And like, and, but it was like at 2012 keto was not at all mainstream. Right. But like, imagine if I had found that in 2012 and written like the first keto offer and just like smashed it and I would be not on this call. I'd be retired on a beach somewhere. Um, but the market's really aware. So you can find out they'll, they'll talk about all these different things they've used for their pain uh, points and their problems. And you can find really interesting uh, products as well as like uh, potential solutions. You're muted, Justin. Rob Keeler is not muted. Reminder to everybody, please put yourself on mute or you're going to be removed. Um, the number one lead working right now. So, okay, Rob, you're getting kicked out. See you, buddy. Um, so the number one lead working right now, you have, you have a couple different offers working right now that are, that are crushing. Let's dive into, uh, I would love to bring up at least like one of the examples, if we could share it on your screen, um, and show them kind of the leads you're writing and, uh, kind of copy achieving for these that are, that are just crushing right now in 2020. Yeah, hundred percent. Happy to do that. Let me pull it up here. One second. Yeah, I mean, the one I'll, I'll do is this BioHarmony one, um, which is one that I've, I've shared in Copy Accelerator with our members. Now, so this one was not written by me. It was written by a guy named Chris Wright. Um, and he wrote one before this called Lift Factor, which did really well. Then he did this one, which is a weight loss one. Then I took the same model and applied it to a, a wrinkle uh, kind of offer, another one kind of like... Uh, another skin offer for a client that has done extremely well. Then um, Jeremy from our mastermind applied the same model to his like digestive offer. And that thing now is just scaling. And he had his first like 200 and 300 sale days. Uh, then I applied it again to something else I just wrote. And now honestly, I'm sort of just ripping this model like again and again and again. And what's funny is that back in the day for the Lions publishing guys, like we would, I, I had like a similar kind of model that I did again and again and again, it worked every time. And then one of my ex partners who runs a 30 to $50 million a year company in the health side uh, has the same similar model and runs it again and again and again. So I've actually, I kind of got away from these types of offers. Um, and this one is not Facebook compliant. I'm sure there's gonna be questions that I might chat hidden. I mean, it is and it isn't. There's a bunch of versions of it. This one's the one that's saved. I have another version that's more, um, even a little bit more compliant. But, um, you know, it's been going great. It runs anywhere from, I don't know, 300 to 600 sales a day. Please don't steal it, you know, but <laughs> I kind of hate saying that, but, but the point is really, if you look at it here, um, like, and again, Chris is a great writer, the guy who wrote it. And, and, but it's funny because I looked at it, I was almost mad at myself. Cause I'm like, damn, you know, I used to like follow the same template kind of, and then I got away from it some, and then Chris was smart enough to go back to it and it's doing great. And really all, all it is, is, um, you know, like a, a good headline that promises like sort of intrigue and something sort of um, like, a, like a big pain point in like a big way. 
and then write into like a, a, a story lead that's going to like basically promise it an emotional story and um, then like have like a big trigger event. So, you know, this one of BioHarmony, right? How a humiliating high school reunion led one woman to discover the BioHarmony switch and finally win the battle with her waistline. I think originally his version was like drop, you know, 42 pounds or something, but I, for Facebook, even then I, I didn't want to make a really specific weight loss claim. So win the battle for waistline. You know, we do have the attention woman over 35, tired of endless dieting, exercising and counting calories. So we are trying to call out kind of who is this for, what are their pain points? Um, and then like the promise of winning the battle with their waistline. You know, this simple solution is being used by hundreds of women across the country to melt the fat away, restore their slender body and make their friends green with envy. And this is, this version has got a little bit more fat shaming than the Facebook version on it, but, um, you know, it is what it is. So I'll just kind of read part of the lead. To what, what, one thing I want to make clear, right? Like this, this is an actual real story from a real woman. Yeah, They is. changed her name and they used kind of like stock pictures for it, but the story is actually true in a real story. Yeah, it is. And that's important. We have like a, even, yeah, we, we we're kind of careful about that stuff, but yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, Hey, my name is Scarlett. Peralta, and over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you a humiliating true story about my 15th high school reunion. It was the moment I came face to face with the fact I was overweight and everyone could see it. Truthfully, it was hard to miss. My rolls of ugly belly fat were slumped over each other. My neck had disappeared, swallowed up by too much flesh, and loose fat hung off my arms like it was trying to escape. But after that night, I couldn't keep lying to myself. Clothes I bought just a year before now pinched deep into my hips as they strained to hold everything in. And every time I logged into Facebook, I'd see old pictures that reminded me of how hot I used to be. I'd reached my breaking point. Right then I decided to lose my extra fat and restore the slender and sexy body I once had. And girl, I'll tell you, it was the best decision of my life because it sparked a desperate struggle to lose weight that led to the discovery of an incredible, unusual weight loss secret, something that has helped me cut pounds of ugly, nagging fat with very little effort. So really the lead, like all it is is dimensionalizing her pain points like a lot. And she's not like calling them fat. This is actually really important too. Like we're not saying like, hey, are you like, are you a fat piece of shit? Like, do you feel like your neck is this or that? Like we're telling her story about it. And like, that's the, that helps because, you know, people can read and see themselves in her story, but we're not actually making the reader feel like a total piece of crap, even though there's some kind of like brutal language here on this. Right. Um, And we're, we're immediately promising this big humiliating story about a high school reunion, which is like something that is um, intriguing, right? It's kind of like gossipy, what happened, a little sensational and everything like that. Um, and then from there, it goes right into the story, which is essentially this big sort of shocking story. And this is the same model again and again. Uh, but basically in this one, she goes to her high school reunion. She sees her like best friend from back in high school. She hasn't seen in a long time. And people used to say that they were twins. But when her best friend from high school sees her, she doesn't recognize her. And the girl, uh, Scarlett, whose real name is not Scarlett, but... Um, is like kind of devastated because they used to look exactly the same. What happened? Why has she gained all this weight while her friend looks great still? And that sets her on this sort of quest to find like the answer and it goes into like the you know sales letter and the mechanism of the problem, mechanism of the solution, everything else that's sort of in my sales letter outline. So the big broad strokes again though are like kind of teasing like a big thing, like a big uh how like a big catastrophic like event, punch into the gut event, is what led them to discover this sort of unique name mechanism secret that led to a good outcome. And then talking a little bit about the, 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 how giving them a big promise, but how like they're, they're teasing their big pain point and emotional story and then getting into the story pretty fast. And from there going into the mechanism and solution, that's sort of like the model that I've been using lately um, with, you know, without exception. And I mean, honestly, it's just doing really well. I honestly wasn't going to share that on this call. Cause I, you know, I'm kind of worried about everybody using the same one, but um, it's, it's, going really well one, one thing i want to make clear too like you can take stories from forums uh and then transition them into your sales letter like just use the story as a way to kind of grab their attention like maybe it's a, a story about diabetes and then you transition it with uh something like this type of thing could be happening to you or this type of thing might be something you're worried about and then you transition into your sales letter and that person doesn't actually have to be someone who like used your product or got results with your product. It's just your way of kind of grabbing their attention at the beginning. Um, so like for this one specifically, um, to make it clear to you guys, this story is actually from a woman who works with Stefan, uh, and they just used her story for this sales letter. Uh, this wasn't like one they found on a forum, but like I said, they changed the name. They used kind of stock photos instead of using her actual pictures. 
Um, but you can do this. You can find stories on forums. You can find stories from, I don't know, maybe you have a relative that uh, had a great story. Maybe you just found a story. This is another good example that Stefan uses, the one that I think they just kind of took the, you found this story, correct? Yeah, exactly. So this is for a client's like blood pressure offer that's been doing quite well. Um, so, but yeah, this is the one where I just found this story on, um, uh, like on a forum about basically this man who was at like a restaurant with his wife and uh, like collapsed and then he died like three times on the way to the hospital because his blood pressure had been high. So this is purely from a forum. Um, I'll read you, I'll kind of read you the, the very opening of it, right? So Ohio man dies three times in the same day after ignoring his high blood pressure for over a year. The last thing John remembered was raising his glass into the air, smiling lovingly at his wife and saying cheers. Then before John's glass had reached his lips, he made a faint grinning sound and collapsed to the floor. John's wife started to scream as the German nurse, who happened to be seated a few tables over, rushed towards John's lifeless body, preparing to administer CPR. But by the time the nurse got to John, he was already dead, and that was only the first time John would die that day. In the two hours that followed, he would be declared technically dead two more times, and each time, nurses, paramedics, and desperate doctors would fight heroically to jumpstart John's faltering heart back to life. The fact that John survived at all is a miracle. His doctor later said that his odds of surviving the massive heart attack like that were less than 10%, and yet as lucky as John was, his life would never be the same. And then we get into the super stoned, like doctor expert guy, but you know, hi, I'm Chad Bray. And while it's happened to my friend, John, or by what happened, and while what happened to my friend, John is absolutely terrifying. The truth is I hear stories like this every single day. Women and men who are in their forties or fifties or sixties and beyond, and they go from, from feeling completely fine to the operating table in the blink of an eye. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of times these folks aren't nearly as lucky as John. And if you're thinking it will never happen to you, you should know that John used to think the exact same thing. And it talks about how John wasn't the kind of guy who would have a heart attack and all of this kind of stuff here. So um, yeah, so in this case, like, I literally just found that story. And I love the detail from the forum about the German nurse. It was like some nurse from Germany. I think they were like skiing when it happened. And like a you know, nurse from Germany came and tried to like uh, help resuscitate him. So all I did was take that story. I don't think the guy's name was actually John. I just made that, I just changed his name. Um, but again, that's where you can use these really dramatic punch in the gut stories. But we're not like saying like, we're not going like, hey, I'm John. That, this is a story of me, right? And we're not saying that the doctor is like, John was a patient of the doctor. We're just using the story to really grab people's attention. And then, you know, from there, we can go into like our whole sales letter and the mechanism stuff and, and all of that. Um, so it's a, that, that's where you can kind of take forums and appropriate them. But uh, yeah, girly, John's, John's name was changed. Um, as far as the legal concerns, I don't know who asked with using people from the forums. Uh, I mean, I don't know, like there could be, but like I'm changing the name and, and like, I just generally feel like it's not um, something I'm, I don't know. It's, it's pretty low risk, I think. I th as long as you're not getting so detailed, um, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like uh, you're okay, so. I mean, as long as you're not lying and saying like they used the product when they didn't, that's, exactly. that's, that's an issue. Um, all right, so like we said, those are the number one, I said, the kind of best type of lead that is working right now. It is these kind of emotional stories. Uh, so anytime you can find an emotional story, and, and this doesn't just work uh, in health, uh, it works in survival, it works in financial, it works in biz op, it works in dating. Um, every niche, golf, I mean, every single thing out there, these emotional stories work over and over and over again. So the good stories you can find, if you can find a really good story, uh, whether that's in a forum, whether it's your own personal story, whether it's maybe somebody you know, uh, save those stories and use them at all costs because they absolutely convert. Um, so next one I kind of want to hop into, Stefan, is a question that came in from the Facebook group that was basically, you write a bunch of offers, uh, you're also running two different businesses. Uh, actually, I think even maybe more than two different businesses. How do you manage the time to actually write and also run the businesses at the same time right now? Yeah. So there's a couple of things there. I mean, I, one big secret, because to your point about how, you know, you can't sort of write a sales letter and have a bunch of distractions going on. It's totally true. But because of RMBC, that method, like it actually helps a lot because now it's really these chunks and it's modular. So if I'm like, all right, like I've got a bunch of stuff going on, but I know I can put three hours in today to do my research and I'm actually sit down and I close all my windows. I quit Skype. I don't have Slack up. I don't have Facebook up. And I have just like a 
new Google window that I'm going to make a bunch of tabs for and I'm going to do my research. Then I did my research in like three hours. So part of it is scheduling time for like deep work every week. I mean, you have to schedule that time. Otherwise, I think Ed O'Keefe's the first person who said that uh, soft time will always get moved for hard time, which is really true. So whenever you have stuff that you're, you want to get to, like you're pretty much never going to get to it. Very rare. Um, Cause what you have to get to will take its place. So you have to schedule a hard time. So I'll do that. I've got sort of like reoccurring meetings. Like I have a leadership meeting with my call center. I've got a call with my partner, Cody, um, which is today later. Um, I have like, I have stuff, but it's like set. And I know that those things are set. And then I know where I'm going to have open windows. And then I, I'm very vicious about guarding those open windows of time where I can do deep work. And it's tough because like, you know, someone may want to get on a call on a Monday and I'm like, I can't do it for a week. But it's like, because I know I've got to be spending time doing deep work on stuff. Um, so that's really important, like planning out your deep work. Also prioritizing what you're going to like, what are the list of priorities, right? Here's everything I've got to do. You know, what's actually like urgent and important, like, right. That's those come up. Number, number one, what's stuff that is like urgent, but not important. What's stuff that's important, but not urgent. And you sort of like out of that, the, the, the things that are really the biggest needle movers, it's, it's going to be one to three things. It can't be more than that. Taking those things and being like, okay, those are what I want to accomplish this week. Okay. what well, here's my, my schedule. What hours of time first, how long do I think it will take for me to do each of these? Okay. What are the, the blocks of time available? How can I break these up into chunks where they're going to match up with what I actually have available in my week? So I take all of that and apply it that way. And then with RMBC, again, it's like each, because each part's modular, it's not like I have to write a sales letter in a week. It's like, I have to write the research in you know, this week, when can I do that? Okay. Well, I have three hours here. I'll do research then. I have to do a mechanism. When can I do that? Okay. Well, on Wednesday I've got from 12 to 2:30 available. I'm gonna do the mechanism there. And I've got an hour from 3.30 to 4.30. So if I don't finish there, I can kind of come back to it at that point. So suddenly, like, you know, because you're doing it in chunks, like you have, it's way easier. And you can start and stop more easily because you're just doing the little, like the little checkpoints. And then even with the brief, once you, that brief really is, once you answer those questions, you've written a big chunk of your sales letter. Because like, again, remember two parts of my sales letter outline are the mechanism of the problem and the mechanism of the solution. Well, you already did the mechanism, right? And you did it in three hours. That's a huge part of the sales letter already done. And then in the brief, you do like the background story, the stuff about the products, like you, you're doing it. So guess what? Like that's a big chunk that's now like already done too. Um, so that's the biggest part. So I'll spread that over a couple of days. And then the last thing I'll say with, with kind of running a bunch of businesses is I thought about this and I just am a very ruthless uh, delegator too. I mean, I have, I, I built teams and I have people that run these businesses and people come to me for things that I could do in five minutes and I don't do them. I delegate them. Cause every, if I, if all those little five minute things, um, kind of started adding up or adding up, um, you know, suddenly that's an hour or two hours a day that I lost. So, you know, even little things that I could do, I have somebody on my team and I'm, Hey, you, can you do this? And, and I'm just ruthless about that. I think it kind of surprises people sometimes. Cause like, they'll be like, Hey, can you get me this? And I'm like, sure. Here's this person on my team, get this for them. And I think they're weirded out that I didn't do it, but, that's how I'm so effective and how I'm able to run like a shit ton of businesses and, and do everything that I do. One thing I want to kind of expand on what you hit on is the time that you're actually writing and guarding that time ruthlessly. I'm the same way. So my mornings is basically 7:30 to 10 AM is guarded ruthlessly in terms of that's when I write my daily email. And that's when I do usually one other thing. That's the biggest thing for the day that I have to get done. Um, and, and when I mean I guard that ruthlessly, I, I really do in terms of like just the other day, the guy who's building my pool wanted to come by and have a conversation with me at nine o'clock about something on the pool. And I was like, no, uh, we, and we find a different time to do it. And he was like, well, that's the only time I, I'm like, well, then we're going to wait till next week. Um, yeah. And like a lot of people would not be like that. They'd be like, oh, OK, well, we'll meet at nine. Um, but by guarding that time ruthlessly and like I said, writing my daily email for me, I know is the most important thing I can do in my business. Um, I make sure I do that every single day, first thing in the morning. Uh, because if I try to wait till two or three in the afternoon to do it, life just gets in the way. Things pop up, other stuff pops up. Uh, there's a million different fires that kind of pop up during the day that I wasn't expecting. Um, so by getting it out of the way and getting the most important stuff done early before kind of the day gets going, uh, you can really secure that time and make sure you're 
kind of the most productive. And kind of on that same note is, is realizing too when you really uh, work the best. Like I, I'm really good in the early morning, like for writing. That's when I just like knock out stuff. I'm pretty shit at like this time or three, four in the afternoon when it comes to writing. So kind of trying to figure that out about yourself in terms of what hours you're actually most effective is, is pretty big help too. I think, I think a huge secret is that most of us don't need to work an eight hour or 10 hour a day, right? We, we do it because we think we have to, and we just find a bunch of like things to fill in the time. And we feel guilty if we get up from our computer and walk away. But realistically, if your big needle mover is to write a new sales letter that isn't going to make you a bunch of money in royalties or it's your own sales letter or it's whatever, you know, if you wake up, I like to wake up early. So say I wake up at 5 a.m. and I start at like 6.30 or 7 and I go for like three hours and I do that every day of the week, I basically can write that sales letter in the entire week. And I've worked from like, you know, maybe 7 to 10 or 7 to 10.30. And then, you know, maybe I'll schedule calls in the afternoon. So I've got calls there. Um, but then like the big thing is then pulling yourself away from the computer, not sitting there feeling like guilty and, and hating yourself for having a life on top of that. Um, so I think a lot of us really try to fill in the hours of like the, like the day um, when we don't have to. Um, so let's, one thing I wanted to do, I actually did not tell you this, but I want to give people, can you log into the, your RMBC account and give people kind of a little, a little sneak preview at the, what it looks like inside. I can. Hopefully it's like, you won't all just be able to hack it after I show you guys, but let me do it. <laughs> um, yeah, I have it open. Give me a second here. There we go. Um, one of the things I really wanted Stefan to kind of share the art. So if you weren't aware, he released his RMBC course this week, which has been like years and years in the making. Uh, he mentioned to me the other day that um, this is a couple of weeks ago when he, he said he was going to release it. And in my head, I was just like, oh, he's probably going to charge like four or five grand for it. Uh, uh, that seems about right in my head. And then like two weeks ago, he was like, oh, yeah, uh, it's going to be like a thousand bucks. And I remember being just kind of shocked because uh, we teach this in our Copy Accelerator group. And in the Copy Accelerator group, it's about $35,000 a year to be in that group. Um, so the fact that he's selling this for a thousand bucks is really is a steal. Um, and if you can afford it, I, I really highly recommend it. There's not a whole lot of things I actually recommend to people on my list. Um, I don't promote stuff every day, every week. Uh, but the, the RMBC is 100%, uh, gets my recommendation. So I, I want something to kind of run through it and show you exactly like what's in it and what's behind the scenes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. And I know I was almost scared to, to show, um, Justin, like my course, because I didn't want to get mad at me because of how, like how comprehensive this is. Um, and obviously we have copy accelerator, which is, you know, 35,000 plus a year. Um, of course, copy accelerator does have different stuff. It has weekly trainings and a bunch of other things. Uh, but that being said, like, I, I really, I've realized in the last year that like, I love teaching training. Uh, I, I've realized that I'm one of the best, I, not cop. I'm, I'm one of the best copywriters and that's great, but I'm one of the, I'm, one of the best teachers of copywriting. Um, and a lot of it is because of my method. And I've just seen from Copy Accelerator and even before that, like I would hire people off Craigslist for my, and who had no, didn't know what copywriting was. And then I would like teach them copy through my RBC method and be writing seven and eight figure promos within, you know, four months, three months, up to six months later. Um, and so it really works. And then I, so I wanted to be able to transfer all that knowledge to as many people as I could, whether that's freelance copywriters, right, who are get terror, terrorized, a feeling of terror when they see a blank white page or who don't know where to start or who get stuck or who don't have consistent results, right? I wanted them to be able to have something that they could follow this framework in the system and they could get like predictably better results, write better copy, get better clients, charge more money and do all that. And like when you see people in Copy Accelerator, it's like, Scott Mills doubled or tripled his income. Uh, you know, Dan Lock, or not Dan Lock, Ed Ray, who used to be Dan Lock, you know, now freelance has, has had an incredible, um, you know, increases income. Sam Robson, I mean, the list goes on and on. And then with business owners, you know, they've grown from, they've launched new businesses and suddenly they're doing seven million or, or seven figures or eight figures or whatever. So the point is it really works and helps and I wanted to share and it had to be really comprehensive. So I created RMBC, right? This, this course, my RMBC method. And I really, 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 really went all out on it. Uh, I'll give you guys like a really brief overview of how it kind of works, right? So 
there's the, the welcome module, which is sort of like, I mean, I'll show you guys real quick, but you know, this one's really just, um, you know, what's getting covered, like a bunch of the resources and materials from the course, kind of doing an overview of all of the stuff that we're going to be going through, my method, my process, all of that. Nothing like uh, mind blowing. I mean, it's good. It is mind blowing, but it's not like the meat of it. Then we have like research. Obviously it's RMBC. So we wanted to hit RMBC in the next module. So, you know, you've got the overview where I'm giving you the overview of, of everything. You get my actual kind of research questions. You've got the transcripts as PDFs for everything, the lesson document. You can see that, you know, the overview video isn't going to be um, like the audio, but it's a good uh, nice overview. But then there's examples too. So I, I do research in real time for like a weight loss offer. Then, I, then uh, Roman from Copy Accelerator does it for real estate. Uh, Joey Percy does one for high ticket coaching. Uh, Rob Tuwell from Copy Accelerator does it for tax savings. So for all these, it's like the same research questions and you're watching as these different people are going through and actually doing their research in real time, answering the questions, getting the answers, understanding how they need to do it and everything, right? Um, and that's just for research. So if we go back to like our wonderful modules here, sorry, I'm not good at navigating my own course still. So give me one second here, go back this way. Next is mechanism, right? So here we've got um, like, you know, same thing, overview. There's an example from uh, Gary Benson Vega's olive oil like letter. I do one for a, um, a nail fungus offer and as a financial, but what's really cool too, I'm gonna show you guys this now. Give me one second, I wanna hide my screens, I'm gonna pull up my Facebook, because I want you guys to see something really cool. Give me one minute, it's gonna be worth it. Okay, so then like there's this Facebook group you get into when you get the course as well, right? And the reason I bring this up is because like, well, I've got these awesome mechanism examples, like I want people to be able to ask like, hey, um, you know, are you able to like, what they needed. So people wanted even more of me doing mechanisms in real time. So they basically asked that. You can see I'm pretty active with answering questions in the Facebook group, right? It's super active. So I'm actually going to go through and do like 10 more mechanisms in real time and like chiropractic work, financial like uh, industry, like all kinds of different uh, like SaaS, like everything people have asked for. I'm going to do a bunch of mechanisms in real time and add those to the course. But you've already got a bunch of examples, breaking it down, showing you how they're written, why they work, all that kind of stuff. We move to the brief. Same thing here, you've got the um, overview examples, and then for this biz op one, I actually do it in real time. So you see me actually writing my brief, doing the answers in real time, which is really important. So over the shoulder, you get to see it. Copy, same thing, we go through my outline. I actually, with this one with my outline, I then verbally basically do a sales letter in like 20, 15 minutes, just by going through the checklist. And, and you can do that too with this checklist. You can speak, like you can answer the kind of questions in the copy format, verbally record yourself, get it transcribed, and basically have a sales letter written in like 30 minutes if you want to. And then you can come in and clean it up and everything like that. Um, and then we have a bunch of examples. So I go through all these sales letters and I look at, okay, like I have the outline up on one side of the screen, the sales are up on the other side of the screen. I go through, I literally read every word of each of these sales letters in different niches, biz ops, survival, weight loss. And then um, Jeremy did one too, Jeremy Reeves for gut, where I'm, I'm literally going through line by line and showing you how it matches the outline, what you do and all that kind of stuff. So that's like RMBC, right? And I could have just done that and made it a course, but I'm like, there's so many more important elements to being a great copywriter. So I decided to do something with fascinations, which are curiosity bullets, right? Um, so I give you an overview. I show you what the right fascinations are. I mean, going back to here, you'll see that you get like um, the types of fascinations, then you get a bunch of examples of fascinations and bullets. Um, you do all that good stuff. Then I actually went ahead and decided to do something in real time. So I filmed myself. If you watch me, like I'll just kind of fast forward, but you'll see me like working and um, doing fascinations in real time. I'm going through, I'm pulling them out. I'm writing them. You can watch me do that. And that's basically for everything that's in this course. You get to watch me doing it in real time. Um, I was like, all right, well, leads are really important, right? We talked about leads. So I go through six different leads and different um, verticals that like I've written all of them break down the leads, break down why they were good, why they weren't good, like what I could have changed, kind of give you my, my template for writing great leads, doing a variety of niches, you get that. Did a whole module on writing killer headlines, where I give you like basically my seven steps that the best headlines in the world have. I basically looked at all of John Carlton's best headlines and realized that they all kind of shared these seven things. And then I give you shit tons of examples of killer headlines, show you how to write killer headlines too. 
There's the subject lines and ad creatives where I'm going through and showing you this matrix that I use to basically create as many subject lines as you want. And these could also be for headlines in as little time as possible. Um, so like you get, like, oh, there's a spreadsheet that you use where you plug it, you pull stuff out of a, of a sales letter or an advertorial or whatever, plug it in. You can write subject lines in seconds. My AOV money close, which Justin has talked about, which is where you, anytime you're selling more than uh, one quantity or something, whether it's like a supplement offer or there's different packages, there's things you can add to the copy that will increase your AOV by like 20, 30, $40, depending on your price point. So I give you the exact template, the steps. Like if you go in here, um, you'll just see like, okay, here's like the steps for them. Here's examples. I'm breaking everything down for you. You get the PDFs. Again, every single one of these things has videos where I'm doing them for you in real time. It's definitely worth way more than 1K to what Ian yeah, just said. I appreciate you saying that. Um, but like, you know, for example, Craig Ballantyne's copywriter just uh, emailed me today and said that this is already by far the most, the best copywriting course he's ever been in. Uh, Chris Evans said he felt like he was stealing from me. Brian Castanega said that it was worth at least five times as much and that it was crazy. Um, so that's just up to the AOV money close. Yeah, Tommy said he feels like he stole 1K from me. <laughs> totally agree. Um, okay, but then we have bonuses. I'm still not done actually, right? So here's a shit ton of bonuses. One is me doing, uh, I wrote an, a Keo sales letter from scratch, right, as we were starting Copy Accelerator. So I filmed myself doing the entire thing. And so I basically take you through step by step and you'll see how long it took me. You'll see me, what I wrote for each thing. You'll see why I made the decisions I made, how I came up with the mechanism, um, all these sorts of things. Like you'll see the actual sales letter and you'll be able to like, I, I walk you through my decision-making process. I mean, freaking everything. Um, there really is more though. I know uh, I see you guys laughing about it, but legit there's like shit tons more, um, which is awesome. And it's a, living, it's a living, breathing thing. And I'll get into that in a second too. Um, so anyway, look, here's like the keto thing. You can literally see how long the whole thing I think took me, uh, I forget how long, 17 hours from scratch to finish. So you can watch me, including the editing, which I know somebody asked about the editing. I talk about the editing decisions I made too. Um, advertorials, right? I was like, all right, a lot of people who do affiliate marketing, um, I, I understood that like, that's really important. Heath Wilcox, one of the best guys to run advertorials out there right now. He's a copy starter member. So I had Heath do like a full module on how to write a, you know, killer advertorials. He goes through his process and the video is giving you tons of examples. Um, you know, I wanted to just cover advertorials because I think those are important and a lot of people have pain points with that. I have a module where I kind of explain the big idea, you know, making it simple. How do you get a good big idea? What does that actually entail? Uh, a bonus module on coming up with mechanisms for a health offer. Because I know that's difficult. People say, how do I come up with a good, unique mechanism for a health offer? Well, I show you. I literally go through for like a made up, I made up a brain product, go through, do the research, where I go, what I'm looking for, the science I find, how I find ingredients, everything. Feel myself doing the entire thing um, as another module. Mike Montempo is a copy Sorry to remember. I had him do a module on writing killer Facebook ads. So Mike goes through and kind of gives you his formula for how he writes Facebook ads. They do seven figures a month in ad spend. Um, you get that and mini sales letters. So there's two examples here I go through because here's the thing, my sales letter outline isn't just um, for like long form, right? RNBC works for everything. I actually want to talk about that too. But if you think about it, like even like a thousand word script actually follows the same structure. It really does. There's like the lead, the background story, there's a mechanism, it's just shorter. So there's two examples. One's for a mini sales letter uh, uh, that I wrote for a sports betting offer back in the day. And then um, one is a mini sales letter for a tumor product that my friend wrote to run on Facebook as an affiliate. So basically it's like a Facebook ad, um, but it's done in the kind of context of being a little uh, mini kind of sales letter, but the call to action is to click to go to the page and to buy. Um, so that's everything there. I mean, it's really A to Z, but when I said, right, I'm not done, right? I'm still not done. It's true. So basically like, what you guys will see is I realized I really want a good module on email creatives, right? Um, I mean, I've got that one about subject lines and it has some of this stuff here, but um, I wanted to do even more. So I had a, a Jared Harlan, who's in copy starter. He does works for natural health Sherpa. He's made over um, earned a million dollars in affiliate commissions for natural health Sherpa in the last uh, six months. So I asked him and paid him to do a, um, a whole module on how they write their email swipes and creatives when they're promoting affiliate offers. So these work for warm lists or they work for, you know, cold traffic, things like that too. So there's like an, an hour video on basically his whole process, exactly what he does. He shows you how to write the creatives in real time. Then he shows you several examples of creatives that they've run that have worked really well to their list. 
Then he has another video, part two, that's like 47 minutes long with Michael Rochin, who's also in Copy Accelerator, where they go through and write a creative in real time and you watch them from start to finish. And right now it's in a Google Drive folder because I just got it back yesterday, but I'm gonna next add it to, it'll be part of the course. Uh, Jonathan Boyd, who's in Copy Accelerator, keeps writing these upsells that convert at 40 or 50%. So I asked Jonathan, hey, can you do a module just all about upsells and like how you're getting these crazy take rates, your process for writing it, how you use RMBC, how you apply it to this? And he said, sure. So now Jonathan's writing a whole module for upsells. And again, you're gonna get like 10 more videos I'm working on about like mechanisms, doing them in real time for you. And I'm really not done. I'm just gonna keep adding shit until like there's literally nothing um, left. I just like, I'd like, I don't want, it's not like I'm competitive. I just, I want this to be the most comprehensive copywriting course on the planet and it already is. And with the Facebook group, uh, I'm only committing to like personally answering stuff for the next like, I guess like 30 days or so. And then I'm probably gonna put on like a team member or somebody coming in and answer. Right now, people in the group get to ask me questions and like um, all that kind of stuff too. Tosha, good question. Is, is pitching covered? Um, not explicitly, but here's a secret. RMBC is very explicit. It can very, very easily be applied to that. Like when I pitched Copy Accelerator at our Austin Mastermind in September, my PowerPoint literally followed my sales outline and followed RMBC. So I actually am thinking of making a module for people who sell from stage, showing you exactly how you can apply RMBC um, to that. Uh, it doesn't get into like the, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't get to like you know, the, the building your career. It doesn't get into like structuring deals. I mean, those are things that are really important and I do want to do trainings on those in the future, but it's really just how to write killer copy from A to Z. Yeah. Every video has a transcript. Every video has closed captioning. Um, every video there's, yeah, the accompanying documents. So yeah, I mean, when you look at all of that, Obviously I'm biased, but it's really the most comprehensive agency training that I think has ever been created. And that's kind of what people are getting. I can, I can shut up Justin, if you have any questions about it, but I mean, you know, I don't know, man. I just like, I just am I'm pretty, pretty proud of what I created here. And, and I'm excited that, you know, people are responding so well to it so far. Yeah, man, I, I, I've gotten a ton of, I mean, it, it's interesting because when I wrote, say, Hey, you know, you actually, I'm cut the audio cut out a second. Let me take off my headset. When I was writing a lot of copy, um, I was actually one of the people who was always against writing copy to a system. Um, hey, Justin, I, I'm still not hearing you in my audio. Give me a second. I don't know what happened here. Can everybody else hear me? Somebody give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, everybody else can hear me. It's just you. I know he can. I think it's just me. Okay, so I'll keep um, talking. But I got to see if I can figure out how to switch my audio setting. Um, yeah, so I, I was actually one of the people who was always against writing copy to a system because I always had the idea that if you needed a system, uh, you weren't actually a really good copywriter. Um, and my mind has completely changed on that since running the Copy Accelerator program with Steph and watching uh, the people that we, basically watching the people that we coach every single week. Uh, there's new, new people, there's people who are intermediate copywriters, there's people that are advanced copywriters, all following the system uh, and cranking out winners literally faster than they have before and writing better copy than they have before. So it's really just kind of one of those things where I've just seen the proof over and over and over, over again, which is why I'm such a big kind of proponent of RMBC because it cuts down the writing process, it makes things simpler, uh, and it just flat out works. I mean, you can't argue with the success that Stefan's had. You can't argue with the success that the copywriters that he's coaching have had. Um, there's a lot of copywriters out there who, who are really good copywriters, but who struggle to coach. And that, that's actually very different from what Stefan does uh, because he, he can actually explain it. It's kind of like the guy who has been able to pick up girls since he was like 10 years old, trying to teach some nerd how to pick up women. And he can't, he can't verbalize any of it because he actually doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, he's just kind of natural to him. Whereas Stefan's actually super, super good at the coaching part and teaching uh, what it is he's doing so that you can understand it. That's, that's probably one of the biggest benefits here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it's, and it helps, I mean, to feel like assets more mechanical than being creative. And like, that is a huge part of it. You still, there is definitely still freedom within the, the guidelines and there's still cool things to come up with. And, and, you know, it's not like you're just a robot, but um, it's very structural. I mean, going back to, because the reason I created this was again, so I could write 12 sales letters a month and change my life and, and financially and everything, which it did. It changed my life entirely to go from making $10,000 a month. Yeah, at, perfect. Oh, Vasana, Vasana, gotta mute. 
um, yeah, went from making like at, at most $10,000, which is, I mean, at, at most, like that was like the best month. Most months it was probably like four to 6,000, which again was, you know, good money at the time and happy about that. But to go from that to making, you know, 50 to $80,000 because I could just pump out copy like that, um, changed my life. And then when I started my own health supplement offers and I could write my own copy and I knew it was going to be good. Um, and then it converted better than everyone else's copy converted, um, at, which meant I got all these affiliates once I figured out affiliate marketing and scaled to $23 million. Well, guess what? My life changed again because I became like a legit millionaire. And then to now have be able to do this on demand where I can, you know, pump out offers for myself or for clients. It's like, I know that I'll never be broke again because of this method and process. So it so started out of necessity. Um, but it's really something that, you know, it, it just works no matter where you're on the journey. I know, I mean, Marco asked if I would recommend it for beginners. Um, yeah, I, I really think so. Actually, I, you know, you, sh you should know what like a sales letter structure, like a sales letter looks like and is. And if you know what that is, um, and you kind of know what direct response copy is like on a very broad level, um, then I really think that, um, yeah, it's, it's something that can change your life. I've given it to total beginners and they've, uh, you know, excelled really fast. It's been, it's been really remarkable. I, I would say for the beginners who are curious, you're going to learn from somebody, uh, to get better at copy. So you might as well learn from the RMBC system, which I think in my opinion is, is the easiest to grasp and the quickest to kind of get results. Uh, so, I mean, if you're a beginner, I, I think it's actually even more important so that you start on the right foot and don't start ingraining bad habits. Uh, that's actually one of the things like Steph and I with coaching copywriters, we have to do a lot. Like there's a lot of intermediate level copywriters where we have to, we have to fix a lot of bad habits they've accrued over the last three, four or five years, uh, and try to get them over. So you're actually better off starting with the RMBC right away. That way you're starting on the right note. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, because it, it's true. Those habits are really brutal. Um, you know, it, it's, it's easier to start with like a blank slate. I think that's why I've actually, why it was so easy to take people who didn't know what copywriting was and get them writing like world class copy uh, within, you know, like less than half a year is because they didn't have bad habits. So that's actually one of the reasons why we did that um, instead of like trying to go out and hire people who were like experienced copywriters because like I was like, eh. But for experienced copywriters who, who commit themselves to it, um, it's been great. I mean, you look at uh, Darren Hanser and he, he'll tell you that this has been absolutely life-changing. Uh, you know, Randall Pruitt. Randall Pruitt had some terrible habits. I love him. And he, he's now like really one of the top copywriters out there. Uh, but it took, he had to finally really embrace the system. And when he finally did, it just changed everything for him. Um, one question I saw getting asked is how long would it take to kind of go through the entire, you know, course? I, it depends. I mean, obviously you got to go at your own pace as well, but, um, I don't know, probably like for the main stuff, not including all the bonuses, maybe like 20 hours, 20 to 30 hours. I mean, it's pretty comprehensive, but like at the same time, like, is that really, if you can set aside three hours a day or even an hour a day and you know that you're getting better and, and it's not like you have to wait till the end to get better. It's like everyone, honestly, a lot of people think the research thing I have is like their, their favorite stuff. Um, and like, you just the research alone could improve your copy overnight and that's before you've even gone through the rest of the course. So, um, you know, I don't know. It, it's, it's one of the most useful and lucrative investments of your time. I can imagine would be going through this training. Cool, man. So we are just over 90 minutes, uh, on this call. So we're going to wrap up. If anyone has any last minute questions, Stefan, can you unshare your screen for yeah, a second? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I saw you put the link in to get it to. Yeah, I put the link in there. So I actually wrote it out here so you can see it. This is probably backwards. <laughs> if you just go to getrmbc.com, uh, that is the link. Uh, if you want to read the sales page, also, even if you don't have any interest in buying it, I would actually go read the sales page because it's a great example uh, of the RMBC method in action. Um, you can kind of study and see what he's doing on the sales page and how it, how it breaks down and how it flows. Um, so yeah, if you go to, I'll put that back up again, get rmbc.com. I'll put it back in the chat. Um, I appreciate what Matias said too. If you go through the chat, I mean, it's, it's been really nice seeing people like Matias just said, brought the RMBC method is definitely the best course I've taken so far from AWI to handwriting uh, successful copy. I've tried a lot of things, but none of the other, Courses will show you exactly how to research and write copy, like actually show you a screen recording of it. So I appreciate you saying that, man. And I know a bunch of other people kind of hopped in here too um, and, and said the same thing. And 
you know, again, I'm really honored by everyone who's, who's gotten it so far. Um, I didn't really know what to expect because it's kind of like niche, but um, the response has been pretty, pretty overwhelming. So I'm really, uh, I'm really thankful. And oh, I mean, Justin, one thing to mention too, I mean, the, the sales page here is like, you know, your link below the sales page, I do have a guarantee. So that's one thing I would mention as well for people. I mean, like, I thought about not doing it because like, it's so good, but like, at the end of the day, I know guarantees are important. So for those of you guys who are kind of like on the fence and you want to get in and see how you feel, then you definitely get that option of, of you know, knowing that you're protected of the guarantee. So if for some reason you're underwhelmed, you know, just let me know when you get your money back. Cool. Uh, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, appreciate everybody chiming in, asking questions and participating in the, in the call. Uh, if you missed anything from the call and you want to rewatch this, I'm going to probably put it in the Facebook group. So if you're in the Justin and Stefan talk copy Facebook group, uh, you'll see it in there. I'll also probably post it on my YouTube channel and I'm, I'm sh I could probably kick a copy to Stefan as well. He could put it on his YouTube channel as well. Um, yeah. So just one last reminder, if you want to grab the course, uh, it is get rmbc.com. I'll put the link again in the chat. Um, Stefan is doing actually answering questions right now in his Facebook group for the next couple of days. So there's some urgency if you want uh, his opinions on some stuff. And if you want to be able to ask questions to him, highly recommend picking it up now instead of two months from now. Uh, Stefan, anything you want to add before we wrap up? No, that's it. I just really uh, appreciate everyone coming on. It's so fun. I love doing this. I love getting to share. Um, and yeah, thank you, Justin, for, for having me on and, and interviewing me. It was, it was a blast. And, yeah, hopefully a lot of you guys will check out this course. I really, I, you know, I'm not going to get salesy on it, but I just sort of, I almost get emotional because I just really know for people who want to get to the next level, who want to crush it, you know, with freelancing, who want to crush it with their businesses. I mean, I just, there's hundreds of success stories of people following this method and it works for them every time. And if you're saying they're like, what do I have to do to take that leap, to break through the wall? Like it's, this is, the course is it, um, you know, or copy accelerator, but copy accelerator is 30, 35 times more expensive. And so, you know, that's a great option too. But like, this is something that, you know, there's even a payment plan option as we'll see if you go to the, the website. Um, I just really hope that if you, you know, you want to level up and you can, uh, if it's at all possible, you should get the course. So, but thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Awesome guys. So that wraps up. Hope you guys have a good day and uh, we'll have the replay up in the Facebook group and I'll probably send it out to my email list as well. Uh, have a good day and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, you guys.